Welcome to series two of my podcast stories of unconscious bias. I'm Smitha Tharoor. In series one, I had the great privilege of hearing stories of unconscious bias from some wonderful people about a wide range of topics. I laughed, cried and was moved in equal measure. I started this series because I wanted the listeners to realize that we are not alone. All of us have similar stories. They may not be the exact same, but when we hear them, we can hear the parallels in our lives. My speakers have all shared their learning and how they manage their unconscious biases, which is also a wonderful life lesson for us. Series two will follow the same style of interview. I hope you enjoy listening. Welcome everyone. In a change from my usual format of hearing stories from personal experience, this interview deals with unconscious bias in relation to a book that was first written in 325 AD, the Kama Sutra. And the person who shares the learning is Seema Anand. Seema Anand is a mythologist, a storyteller with a focus on women's narratives and a specialty in the erotic literatures of ancient India. Seema believes that the narrative of the Kama Sutra was deliberately silenced. This was the first text to give women a platform of equality. It was a brave book that tried to change the status of women in society. Her seminal work, The Arts of Seduction, a commentary on the metaphors and lost narratives of the Kama Sutra, is an effort to reclaim the book for its intended purpose. I'm so pleased that Seema is talking to me about stories of unconscious bias and the Kama Sutra. Welcome, Seema. Thank you, Smita. Hi. Hi. So, unconscious bias, before we even talk of Kama Sutra, unconscious bias, what do you understand by those words, unconscious bias? So, for me, those are all the stories that actually are in our brain that we don't necessarily consciously um, articulate, but those are the stories that motivate and inform all of our actions and everything that we do and how we think. Hmm. Yeah, very succinctly put, and I completely agree with you. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's there in our brain and, and do and think. It's not just about uh, uh, thinking. Uh, it's also about how we, we show it in our actions. You're absolutely right. But I'm going to cut straight to the chase, Seema, because I know the listeners will be wanting to know far more about the research that you've done in your book and unconscious bias lessons, perhaps, that you might have learned. So, you know, you, this book came out a couple of years ago, listeners, but you were able to buy it today as well. I know that. Uh, check on Amazon. But um, the arts of seduction, by the way, in case you didn't hear it the first time around. So Seema, when you were researching for the book, um, now my understanding of the Kama Sutra, and I suspect most people's understanding of the Kama Sutra, is it's a book uh, that was written thousands of years ago in India. It's an Indian book, and it teaches us about sex and about positions of sex uh, in heterosexual relationship between man and woman. And beyond that, um, I don't really much know much else. And perhaps my unconscious bias in relation to that could be that, not that I've read the Kama Sutra, but could be that maybe it's it's also fairly patriarchal, you know, this is what the men requires and needs. I'm not sure. So tell me more, please, from, from, from your perspective uh, when you started researching. Smitha, you're so right. I think everybody believes exactly what you just said because I get people coming up to me all the time and saying, so... Uh, what's the best position in the book? And I guess the first thing, so you have uh, you have two lots of people. You have people who will say, oh, well, um, ha, 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 it's a book about positions. And then you have the others who will take the trouble to say, oh, no, it's not really a book about positions, is it? It's a book about the philosophy of life. But in actual fact, no one really knows what the book is about. And the reason for that is that these all these ancient texts were written as treaties. So they were written in uh, metaphor, they were written in verse, they were written as hymns of praise almost, and they were impossible to understand. So you never really went out and read either the Kam Sutra or the Earth Shastra or um, the, the um, uh, Natya Shastra, you know, all these texts that were written to explain a particular subject. You read the commentaries on the subject to understand what they were about. And yes, when I decided to, uh, I actually came to the erotic literatures through a rather unusual path. As you mentioned, I'm a mythologist. I look at 
the stories of women, because I believe that the stories that we tell subconsciously define our identity. They define who we are. And I, had, I realized that we never ever, you know, so if you tell stories of how um, a man comes home drunk and he beats up his wife and she's so good, she's so good, she never says anything, she's maintained the dignity of the house, then that's what you expect a good woman, in inverted commas, to be. And I realized that we never ever told stories of a woman's right to her own sexuality or her own body. And that's what took me down the path of looking at what are these narratives that we had silenced? And I came upon the ancient erotic literatures of India. And you know what? It was the biggest revelation that I, I cannot even begin to tell you what it felt like. So the first thing that I want to be able to um, correct, there isn't just the one Kama Sutra. It's part of a massive body of work, hmm. huge. Yeah, there's like about a few thousand texts on karma, on love. India is literally, ancient India is literally the only culture in the world that has analyzed and categorized and customized the idea of love because they say that every emotion that you feel is a permutation of love. Even hatred, anger, indifference, it is some kind of, combi it's some permutation of the aspect of love, of karma. And nothing is permanent. That's one thing. The, um, but to come back to the Kama Sutra itself, which I think it's um, really important uh, for people to understand, and I've spent many years now talking about this. The first thing that I discovered was that the book is not about sex at all. I know it talks about positions. It's the tiniest part of the tiniest chapter is the bit about positions, but there was a reason for that as well, which I'll come to in a minute. The book is actually about pleasure. It's not about the act of sex. Do you know at no point does it actually mention, it mentions positions architecturally, what, where your arms and legs should be. It doesn't talk about what you'll feel, doesn't talk about thrusting, doesn't talk about uh, seminal fluids, nothing. It just talks about the positions as architecture. The text is actually about exploring pleasure because pleasure created a certain level of arousal and that arousal created the most uh, amount of metabolism in your body. The highest level of energies in your body come from sexual arousal. And that was the point of this because at no other point do you have that much energy inside your body as when you go through sexual arousal. So the idea was that pleasure was extremely important. Then I discovered, which was even more exciting because I know that whenever I get invited for a talk to do this on a public uh, platform, all the talks that, get, uh, that are about politics or about economy or about finance are always considered more important. This is like the soft subject. In ancient times, they believed that it was success in karma that would make you successful in every other part of your life. Whether you were a warrior, whether you were in business, whether you were in politics, it didn't matter what, it all depended on your success in karma. And when I said that there were thousands of these books, every king who came to the throne ever would have a version of the Kama Sutra written so that, um, People, so, and the reason that there were different versions of the Kama Sutra written, why it was actually commissioned by the king, was because they believed that if a couple could share really, truly, mutually pleasurable intimacy, it meant that the relationship would be stable. If the relationship was stable, society would be stable. If society was stable, the kingdom would be stable. And this is just such basic, obvious information that humanity should understand and know about relationships and about the connection between two people and about just being happy with each other. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm completely uh, uh, enthralled by, by your story and I'm waiting to hear more, but I just wanted to briefly respond to what you've just said, uh, which, is, which is essentially, A, and firstly, just to, to remind the listeners, the word karma means love. And sutra means book, and therefore it is a book of love. It is about, and the fact is not about sex, and it's not about positions, and it's far more about the pleasure. And why? That's what I'm finding very interesting. And this is when we're talking about unconscious bias, and we are looking at books or we're looking at texts, 
or we're even looking at society at large, people may not understand or recognize the connection between the happiness between one family impacting on the rest of society and then the growth of the rest of society as a result, which is, which is uh, brilliant. I mean, it's so obvious. And I wish today's world leaders would understand this. But no, I sorry I interrupted you. I, please can't go back to what you were saying. No, no, I absolutely understand um, your excitement on this because as you can imagine, when I came across it, I it just completely drew me in. This was, you know, I started this research about 12 years ago and I thought to myself, yeah, it's a bit of research. I'll do a little paper on it, 10,000 words, move on. 12 years later, I've only just scratched the surface because it is so fascinating. So this discovery then led me to understand that the text the Kam Shastra, the Kam Sutra, is um, is actually not a book about, as I said, it's not a book about sex. It's about pleasure, but it leads me to understand the enormity of what the author of the Kama Sutra brings to us. Now, you know, you just said that why is it that something something like this that's so basic we don't understand? Because for the longest time, we have considered pleasure to be a sinful thing. Now, it's it's interesting because um, if you look at the history of the world, literally, I believe that a culture, how they respond to sexuality is a very definite reflection on their level of civilization. OK, so in 325 AD, the first ecumenical council of the Catholic Church is set up. And the very first thing that they start to do is, is they they start to talk about how bad is the idea of pleasure. The body is sinful. It is your path to hell. Pleasure is the ultimate sin against God. Pleasure should never be felt. Sex should only ever be had for, um, for having children, but nothing more. At the very same time, coincidentally, at almost the exact, you know, by um, 342 AD, the Ecumenical Council had actually passed its first law banning oral and anal sex because that had nothing to do with reproduction. It was all about pleasure. At the very same point, at almost the exact same time, across the oceans of the banks of the river Ganges, is sat the sage Vatsyayan writing the Kama Sutra. And he is writing about how pleasure is the path to heaven. This is the way that you will achieve God. It is the path to moksha. So we have, particularly in India, I find that we are stuck in this twilight zone between the ideas propagated by the Catholic Church about pleasure being sinful and the fact that our background is actually in the Kama Sutra and what we believe about pleasure. But interestingly, what the, what Vatsa and what the Kama Sutra goes on to say is that um, pleasure is actually different for men and women. Now, you said that you, you think of it essentially as a patriarchal, as a very man oriented book. You're absolutely right, because in 300 and something AD, women were not taught how to read or write. The books were written essentially for men. But this text is written to teach men how to pleasure a woman. However, can, I, different can I ask her one question before you answer this? Yeah. I just want one clarity. So 320 something AD. When the ecumenical church was talking about pleasure being sinful and so on, is that the same time that the Kama Sutra was written? Or was that even older, the book itself? No, the it's original? about the same, it's it's about about the same, same time. It's about the same ah. time. The, the Kama Sutra is written in around 300 something AD, but um, it, it takes all its material. The, the author says that he hasn't written anything new in this particular text. He's taken all his material from books that have been written a thousand years before. Right, okay. So he I just wanted takes, to clarify that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, he literally takes the bits that he likes. He copies and pastes them. He says he's copied Don't and pasted them. <laughs> <laughs> the bits that he likes. Um, but he actually then goes on to distinguish the idea of pleasure because he said, so he writes equally. So like I said, the, the this is a time when only men are taught how to read or write. He writes an equal amount of instructions in this book for men and women. And he says in the introduction himself, he says, I have been asked by people, why have I written so much for women? Women do not know how to read or write. They are unintelligent. They do not know what you're writing in this great treatise. 
And he says that he responds by saying that women, however, have an automatic understanding of the subject. So they will understand it from within. Men need to be taught, hence the instructions have to be given to them. And so he includes instructions for both, which I just think is amazing. Um, he then goes on to say that men and women have very different forms of pleasure. Till then, it had been held across all ancient societies that a woman did not have an independent source of pleasure, that her pleasure depended on the pleasure of a man. The Kama Sutra is the first text that says a woman has an independent source of pleasure and a man has absolutely nothing to do with it. And so this is what actually, it was so controversial at that time. And he's the first one to give women a platform of equality. It was in the bedroom. Yes, the equality in the bedroom. He gives them the right to consent. He gives them the right to decide various things. But still, it was the first time that women were offered a level of equality. It had never happened before. And this statement was so controversial that this is what put the Kama Sutra on the map not because it was the first or the only book written on positions. And I think that the moment we understand what is the ethos of this book, we, it just changes the way that we think about things. Because also, when you go further into it, the idea of pleasure, when you start looking at what pleasure actually means, um, that pleasure, even today, if I mention the word pleasure, most people think that I'm talking about, it's a euphemism for sex. The Kama Sutra takes a great deal of trouble to tell you that it, it is not about sex. Pleasure is a whole different thing. Sex is just the time. The act of sex is the tiniest part of this whole thing. And then he goes on to say, he says, you know, um, pleasure is what arouses your metabolism. It arouses your sexual energy. That's what you need to harness. It goes on also very, very, um, I mean, he's amazingly perceptive. He says, men have a much quicker form of pleasure. Their pleasure arises in the lower part of their body around their genitals, and it goes upwards. It's like fire. It travels upwards to their brain. And like fire, it's very quick to ignite, very quick to douse down. A woman's pleasure is like water. It starts at the head and flows downwards. And like water, it takes forever to come to the boil, and equally, it takes for ever to cool down. How wonderful. <laughs> wonderful analogy. Thank you for that. But I mean, clearly, uh, uh, you know, it's certainly obvious to me and I'm sure to the listeners that the reason why you researched Trikam Sutra and then subsequently wrote your book is because you are a feminist. Um, you believe in gender equality and you wanted you wanted us uh, readers to understand and listeners in this instance to understand that it's so much more about a, a, a patriarchal book and sex and positions and so on. But were there any surprises at all? I mean, this is in itself a huge surprise, but anything else that you you were taken aback at at the time of research that, you know, you had initially had this, I uh, use the word unconscious bias, an implicit opinion, and you were, you were surprised to find X? Yes, I'll tell you what else came to mind when, um, uh, what really struck me, because again, when I started talking about it, I'd get the same sort of reaction, you know, for most people, we've started to think of sex and pleasure and um, everything else connected with it as one little tiny, not even a ball, I mean, it's not even the size of it, it's a tiny little marble in our head, and that's all it is. Um, the thought that you're trying to convert an entire patriarchal society to come to a different aspect of this, where, because you're looking at pleasure now, and you're looking at the fact that women have um, a huge, a larger capacity for pleasure, but it takes them much, much longer to come to excitement, to come to arousal. So how do you take an entire patriarchal society and convert them to the idea of giving a woman that much time and attention. And I thought it was very clever because, it, again, to me, this was one of those little moments of epiphany, you know, where you suddenly think, aha, it's, it's clever. It's, it, you know, when you talk about the unconscious bias and how do you actually access a certain point in order to change that from unconscious to conscious and from that point to then changing your actions, this is, I think, Vatsyayan was the master of it. So he says to the men, he says that your success in life will depend on how well you can pleasure and arouse your woman. 
because <laughs> if the woman feels an immense amount of pleasure, and he see he says this. This is in one of the um, texts um, which now dates back to the seventh century AD, and the introduction actually says that he says, if your woman does not find complete pleasure with you in bed. She will be unfaithful to you. She will spend your money unwisely and badly and make you poor. She will destroy your business. However, if you can pleasure her really well and make sure that she is extremely happy with you, she will look after you. She will love you. She will take care of your money well, and she will protect you and be in love with you even in the land of the dead. Where memory is otherwise wiped out in the land of Yamraj, in the land of the dead, she will retain this memory, and she will always look after you. What a clever man is Abhatsya, <laughs> the writer of Kama Sutra. What? A, because at the end of the day, how you know the point of unconscious bias, and how do we make our unconscious into conscious? You've got to motivate you. You firstly got to reflect. You've got to understand that maybe you have an instinctive reaction. About uh, I'm talking about sex specifically now in this context, yeah, as a man, and therefore this is what you want. But then, how do you motivate yourself to think differently? And along comes Vatsyan to help these gentlemen to think differently. Okay, so the other thing that you have to remember is the moment you talk about pleasure, and the moment you take away that that silly little idea that we've been fed that pleasure is just about the act of sex so there's so much else that goes into the thought of pleasure so the idea is that pleasure takes much much longer and i had several men who came along to me and said oh you know we completely get it and we think it's great but the women are saying oh for god's sake who's got that time da 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 um, how do we change their minds? And I said to them, I said, you know, guys, it is possible to do it, but it's going to take time and patience. It's not just going to happen overnight just because you want it. Like you can't just go up to a woman after so many years and say, well, you know what? You need to start thinking like this. I said, you have to bring them around to the thought very, very gradually. Damned if they were going to listen. They just, I mean, they just kept repeating the same point. Yeah, 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 we get it. But how do we explain it to them? No, you don't explain it. You don't tell it to them. You have to make them understand it from their own inner, inner mind. Yeah, we get that. But how do I explain it? And that was the conversation. Well, that's, this, is, this is such a good point you're making. Because if I use that point that you're making as an analogy to most other things, is that we can never ask other people to change, can we? It is only by our actions and how we behave that the other person will look and see and believe and understand and then possibly change their own actions. Rather than if I were to say to somebody, come on, you've got to do things differently and why are you doing it like this? The person will go on the defensive. So that's totally the wrong, wrong approach. But so now, seeing as... Sorry, I was going to say that there was another thing that uh, you know, the whole thing has been such a revelation. So I just want to explain to your listeners, when I talk about pleasure, you know, when um, I just want to give a little example to try and explain what I mean about extending the mind to encompass so many other thoughts. Now, the Kama Sutra uh, was written in metaphors, and it talks about pleasure to the point where, um, and so delicately, it talks about it with such elegance and refinement that it actually inspired about 2000 years of ancient Indian literature. So the classical Sanskrit and the Prakrit literature of India is all based on the metaphors of the Kama Sutra. And let me explain that quickly. So for instance, in ancient times, uh, for a woman to be on top during sex was not considered the um, official position. I mean, women weren't supposed to be on top because that was supposed to be the position of um, um, dominance, okay, or the position of control. So it, 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 you were in charge of when you wanted to start or stop. And it was considered so taboo that in um, some of the ancient Christian literature, you have Lilith, who starts off as being the first consort of Adam. And it is said that she's made from the same mud as him. And she's actually thrown out of heaven for saying, I'm equal to you, I can be on top. Okay, so being on top was considered completely taboo. The Kama Sutra, however, said that you could be on top. But that particular position demanded a certain architecture. And the architecture of that was that you, you, the woman um, was only supposed to move her hips during this, um, when, when you made love in this way. So you didn't move the other upper part of your body, you just moved your hips. And so the really accomplished courtesans would wear 
little jingling girdles around their upper waist. Okay. And the idea was that you did not make a sound, that those bells around your waist did not make a sound to show that you were only moving your hips. Wow. And in ancient literature, in our ancient literature, you never ever have somebody say, oh, and then she climbed up on top and then she humped her way through. It's never, it, all you would say is she put on her jingling girdle and you knew that she had taken her position on top. So as I said, I think that it was all extremely elegant. It's very, very refined. It's very beautiful. And in keeping with the idea of a woman's pleasure, everything is sort of, it takes its time. There's no, there's nothing in there about rushing and getting to the next point. It's all about using your mental and physical and emotional energies to take you to a particular point. There was no, there was nothing about rushing it because if it wasn't going to be mutually pleasurable, there was no point in having sex at all, according to the, the text. Now, I'll tell you one amazing thing that I have discovered. When I talk about the Kama Sutra and I talk about the, um, the idea of pleasure and the idea of time and the idea of elegance and refinement and all the rest of those lovely things, do you know, I find that my Western audiences find it far harder to comprehend than the Indian audiences. Hmm. Yeah, you know how we believe that the West is sexually um, more, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, they've kind of reached a different point now where... They're liberal, I, I, they're open, they're accepting. Yeah. Uh, a lot of which you do not find in India when you are in India. Uh, today, uh, in my opinion. So that's interesting. Go ahead. So interestingly, you're absolutely right. So they're more emancipated, they're more liberated, they're more liberal in their thinking, they're more accepting in their idea of um, um, sexuality and the body and pleasure. And yet, something in our ancient DNA kicks in when we talk about pleasure, and we are far more capable of understanding it and understanding the beauty behind it. So I think, quite honestly, Smitha, that if we could bring it back, I think that we could change Indian thought so much because the only thing lacking at the moment is the knowledge. They, they just don't know that this exists. This is a silenced narrative. That's, that's extremely powerful, Asima. And I'm, uh, I'm trying to get my head around that. But um... I mean, I'm not going to talk politics. I won't go down that path. However, no, no, no. It is. <laughs> but it, it would be wonderful if we were able to change the, the psyche of the average Indian uh, to think differently, to be less patriarchal, to be more liberal and to, and to recognize what this amazing book has done. Uh, and of course, what you said much earlier on about the fact that if two people are happy, then the family is happy, then the society is happy. And then, of course, the kingdom, uh, the kingdom as you so well put. Yeah, he's stable, uh, which is what we all want all over the world. So really, we should be studying the Kama Sutra for national security. And there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, have there been any surprises regarding unconscious bias that you might have noticed or recognized along the way? But I tell you the other thing that I discovered. Um, I get a lot of people writing in and saying, what about, um, what does it say about homosexuality? And Again, I find myself saying that the book talks about pleasure. It talks about how a woman receives pleasure. It talks about how a man receives pleasure. So even though the, the, the Kama Sutra does talk about relationships in heterosexual terms, the, the, uh, it's, it's a binary kind of relationship that talks about, um, it's heteronormative, but it's, it's not saying that a woman can only receive pleasure if a man does this to her. So I think that the idea was that it broke it down to the unit of pleasure rather than into men or women. And I think that's the next thing that I would like to actually be able to bring to the understanding of the common person is that we are not here talking about whether it's only something that you can feel good about is if you're if you are in a heteronormative relationship. It, it, hmm. it, like I said, it's, it actually takes away from the sexual act. It takes away and puts it into the realm of pleasure, which again, it changes everything. 
You know, you were talking about positions, the famous positions. And so the positions were created to actually bring the sizes of the sexual organs to match. So if the man was too small and the woman was too big, then the position suggested would for her would be where she would lie on her side, her thighs would be placed together. So it would actually decrease her size a little bit. That's amazing. And they've already yes. given you all this advice in 32580 or thereabouts. Yeah. <laughs> So that is the reason for the positions. But because the rest of it is written in metaphor and it's difficult to understand because nobody's in the Kama Sutra, they don't explain to you that if you use this particular perfume over here, what will happen? It just says this perfume is used or it just says um, this particular bit of jewelry is put on. You have no idea what it means. The only thing that you could actually decipher was the architecture of the position. So that's the only thing that we, we've we come forward we with. because that's the only thing that we, Yeah. It's easy for us to understand that rather than read into the metaphors. And that's that's brilliant learning. Absolutely. But uh, but based on on these experiences that you've had in terms of of researching and writing and then obviously having people emailing you and asking you questions and so on. uh, I mean, obviously, we haven't had those experiences. We haven't uh, read the Kama Sutra and and many people would not have read your book, The Arts of Seduction. So how do we whether it's a. A, a, a heterosexual or a gay relationship is not not the point at all. It is about pleasure within a sexual relationship. And so what kind of unconscious biases we what would we have? And, and if so, how do we overcome these unconscious biases? What kind of learning can you give us on that? So if I was to give you just one point to take away, I would say that because, you know, from centuries of carrying this, baggage, centuries of carrying this perception that sex is sinful, pleasure is sinful. Most of us have closed off that part of the mind. You know, we don't even access the idea of pleasure in our own head. It's it's a closed off part of our brain. And so my advice is that start, take baby steps, just go into that part of your own brain that deals with pleasure. Allow yourself to just explore in your own head what might give you pleasure. Don't be frightened of what your own head tells you. You're not going out there and doing it, but at least figure it out. Start to open your channels of energy. It's just the starting point. It's a tiny little thing. But, you know, you wouldn't believe how difficult even that is for most people to do. I bet. I bet. No, that's very good advice. And and. I mean, it's been an, it's been a completely, totally fascinating conversation. Um, I've kind of laughed occasionally. I've been taken aback many times and um, genuinely interested in, in knowing more. But in the interest of time, I'm going to have to pause and say, Seema Anand, thank you so very much for, for your great narrative style in sharing your stories and your understanding on unconscious bias in relation to Kama Sutra and, of course, uh, in relation to the book that you've written, The Arts of Seduction. Thank you once again, Seema. It was a pleasure, Smita. No pun intended. Thank you for listening to my podcast, Stories of Unconscious Bias. If you enjoyed hearing this episode, do tune in every Saturday for a new interview. And if you could share, leave a review and rating, that would be hugely appreciated. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Smitha Tharoor, and feel free to suggest new guests. Until next week. <laughs>